the Piston Fanatic. I'm your host, Dave Dalton, and I'm excited to share my passion and perspective of our Detroit Pistons as we go on this fantastic voyage together. I've been a diehard Piston fan since the days of Dave Bing and Bob Lanier. I've also been the varsity basketball coach of a very successful program in northern Michigan. Well, thank you for listening. It's been a while since I've been on, but I'm excited to be back with you. But please subscribe and like. Today, we're going to talk about a lot of topics. We're going to get just in a little bit about talking about the rest of the season going forward, but we're going to talk about how Kobe Bryant almost became a Detroit Piston, how Jaden Ivey versus Benedict Matherin, the rivalry at the Rising Stars game. We're going to talk about Cade Cunningham, should he get a max, con- max extension. Talk a little bit about Stu, about how the All-Star game was a dud. And so let's get started anyway. So we'll start out with the Rising Stars game. So uh, Jaden Ivey and... Duran played in the uh, Rising Stars game. They got to play on the same team, but it's kind of a difficult thing. So they have, I don't know if they had 10 players on each team, but the game only goes to 40. So 40 is not even quite a bit less than half a game. A lot of games nowadays, you know, 70 at at halftime. So this is a little bit over half of a half. So it's a really short game. So people didn't get many touches. Matherin got the MVP, but he got the most minutes and the most touches and the most shots. And so he didn't have even that great of a game, but there was some little trash talking going on where he's saying, you can't guard me in the Rising Star game either. But I, I, I remember at the end of the last year, the Pistons played the Pacers and Matherin played and Ivy clearly outplayed him. But yeah, it was just, you know, the, the, the Rising Stars thing, it's a cool thing. I like the concept, but they, they have the four teams and one of them is a G League team, which is really undermanned. So the G League Ignite had like three or four players on this Ignite team or the G League team, and they 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 like won hardly any games the whole season. They've been getting smoked like all year. The uh, G League Ignite, so that wasn't a very good team. But the NBA, in my opinion, stacked this so that Wemby would get to be in the finals. So they let the Wemby's team got to play against the G League team, and then um, Ivy Endurance team had to play against Matherin's team that had a lot of Chet and a bunch of good players on their team. So. Anyway, it was a close game, and Ivy played pretty well. Duran was only like one for four. He didn't play that well, but he didn't play that many minutes either. So, But it was just, yeah, it's going to be interesting going forward. There's going to be the rivalry because, you know, Matherin was picked right after Ivy. Ivy was the fifth pick, and Matherin was the sixth pick. So he said he's a great player. Matherin said Ivy is a great player, and I love playing against him and my – my challenge is to always bring my best against him. He said he was drafted ahead of me. There's no hate, but he's a guy that he, he's a great player and he's going to have a great career, but he just wants to, you know, he still wants to outplay him. So we're going to see Thursday that our Pistons play against the Pacers Thursday. So that's going to be really interesting to watch those two go at each other. Ivy's really a competitive guy. So Stu might get to play. So, you know, the, that we're going to talk about that in a little bit, but Stu, you know, they haven't, he hasn't been suspended for that game yet, and so they're probably going to wait until after the courts deal with it. So, anyway, the other cool thing was Ivy's coach was Tamika Catchings, who played for Indiana in the WNBA, and her mom was teammates with Jaden's mom. So they um, knew each other, and there's pictures of T- Tamika Catchings holding Jaden Ivy when he's a baby, and so it was really special for the two of them. And they said, you know. He, Ivy said how it's been full circle and how cool it was that God allowed them to be there in that moment together. But I'm telling you, Tamika Ketchings was one of the toughest players I've ever seen. She was so tough. And I, I loved watching her. I watched her play for Tennessee in the Final Four. And she she just was one of the best WNBA players ever. And she played harder than anybody. She would have been embarrassed to play as hard as the NBA All-Stars played. So anyway, um, yeah, the All Star Game. You know, I know every, I'm not going to take too long to talk about it because everybody knows and all. Everybody has the same take. It was a complete dud, and it, you know, I was so I I got so pumped up when I was a kid and when I was younger to, for the All Star Game to watch all these great players. I mean, I can remember Isaiah Thomas coming down and he bounced bounced the ball off the floor, off the backboard to a teammate who dunked it, and I can't remember who it was, but it was one of the coolest plays I've ever seen, but there are a lot of cool plays. But the plays aren't cool when nobody guards anybody. So it's not cool to watch guys just let people stand around and shoot threes or go in with nobody within five feet of them for a dunk. It used to be they threw, they didn't play defense real hard, and nobody was, everybody was careful not to hurt anybody. But, you know, it's 
they didn't don't even throw alley oops anymore. They because there's nobody back there. There's no reason to. So it, it's just as disappointing. I don't know what the answer is. What I don't understand is why the NBA players they have to hear how disappointed it is. Everybody. I mean, I I and I barely watched it. I mean, I had it on and I was doing other things because it was just no fun. And I love you know the the league is so talented. There's so many great players. They they have to realize. Just try, you know, we've all played pickup basketball. You go down to the gym and people, a lot of people don't bust their butt. I always did. Not that I'm a great person or anything, and I wasn't the greatest player, but I never never let anybody get an uncontested fast break layup when I played, even if we weren't even keeping score. But I just, I don't get why they don't try harder. I mean, I, there was times when I know that Giannis, when he was captain, he, you know, he was talking before the game how his team was going to try hard, and I've heard LeBron say that before, but they certainly didn't try hard today and then the dunk contest obviously everybody says you know none of the good players want to be in it anymore the truth is there's been some dunks since michael jordan and like dominique wilkins and that was supposed to be like the greatest dunk contest of all time but there's you know the dunks vince carter did and even jason richardson and some of these other guys have done some incredible dunks and mcclug he did you know he won it again two years in a row but it was crazy because he's so short and for him to dunk, do the dunks. But I remember Spud Webb, he was 5'7", and he dunked two balls at the same time. I mean, one one right after the other. So, yeah. So, anyway, we're gonna we're also going to talk today, I forgot, a little bit about Chauncey Billups. He's a finalist for the Hall of Fame. So, we're going to talk about that, too. But let's um, talk real quick about Cade. So, there's a lot of my listeners aren't big Cade fans, and they think he's the problem of the team. And... And I do agree that he should not be on the ball all the time. So when he's out there, they should, you know, I still, I disagree with some of you that think he should be off the ball all the time, but I think that he should be off the ball some of the time. And I, again, I constantly say that they should stagger him and Ivy so that one of them is on the court all the time. And if it's easily to be, it can be done easy. And same thing with, um, Duran and Asar, that they can play at the same time together, but they can also be staggered. And again, it's just going to be fascinating to see what Monty does. It's going to be a key for the rest of the season. What are we going to do? You know, we got to play. I mean, I feel like there's eight guys that have to play. And and so they got to be prioritized. So you, like, for example, Evan Fournier and uh, Trey Brown Jr. So they're both good players, but you can't play both of them if you're going to play... Um, Fontecchio and Asar, you know, there's just not minutes and you can't, it's just, you know, Monty, again, actions over words. Monty came out and said that before the last game that I can't play 10, 12 guys. I can't play 11 guys. I mean, some guys are just not going to get to play. Well, he's right. But what did he do? He had like the first half of that, the very day he played 12 guys in the game in the first half, even. And so it's just it's just not going to work, and we just got to the, – these last 28 games are really, really important, I feel like, to find out where we're at, where we're going, and what we want to do with guys. So anyway, with Cade's extension, so I'm going to tell you the truth. I When he first started out the year, he didn't start, start out too great. He turned it over a lot. His shot was inconsistent, and I thought, oh, no, what are we going to do? Are we going to – you know, it's, you know, I thought we probably would give him the ex- max extension, but I wasn't. I thought, man, this is still iffy. But then, you know, he had that. He had a big stretch where he played uh, 23 games and he averaged almost 25 points and um, shot really high percentages. He shot 48% from the floor, 35% on threes, 87% on free throws, every seven and a half assists, and less than three turnovers. So that's a rookie max player and to just compare when um isaiah thomas was 22 years old he averaged 21.3 and he had 11.1 assists per game and playing 37 minutes but he shot 46 percent and 33 percent on threes isaiah's year that we won the first championship he was 27 so there's i i've said this on podcast before almost every great player has won championships at at the age of 27 was their first championship. So anyway, in 88-89, Isaiah averaged 19.5 points, shot 46%, 23% on threes. Of course, Isaiah would have been a great three-point shooter, so the three-point shot wasn't as 
it wasn't done nearly as much back then. So it was a whole different thing back then with the three-point shots. Way fewer were, were taken. And I'm confident that if Isaiah were doing it today, that he would be shooting a lot more and his percentage would be up. But my point is, you know, and, and everybody's numbers are elevated right now. Everybody scores more points than they used to, too. So that's a, a real thing. But anyway, Cade's numbers are really good. And Cade's a really great player. And he's a great leader. But he's shown enough stretches. He's shown me enough at age 22 that he is going to be a great player. There are some concerns. He said he's having some good days and some bad days with his knee. And he says, but, you know, he's, he uh, credits the training staff that they're really helpful and they have an answer for everything. And so I hope and after this all-star break that his knee is, is completely, you know, healed. And so I don't think it'll be an issue with the rest of the season, but you never know. So I'm wearing my day, my Chauncey Billis jersey today is autographed, but it's uh, um, Chauncey is one of the finalists for the Hall of Fame. And it would be so cool if he got in. So he's a finalist in this a weaker class so that makes, uh, I think, the odds for him getting in a lot better. So the nominees of the, the number one guy that's going to get in for sure is Vince Carter. So he, I mean, again, when he was in the dunk contest, those were superhuman things. And I don't know why, you know, but again, nobody in the all-star level are, are get, entering the contest. But um, so Michael Cooper, that Super Cooper that played with Magic and... Um, Vince Carter, Chauncey, Walter Davis, those were four of the guys. And so they announced the finalists, but now the it's going to be decided and they're going to present the um, who gets in on April 6th, and that's when the men's final four is. So, But Chauncey, in 2004, he was 27 when we won the championship again. Michael Jordan and Giannis and Steph and all those guys, they were all, LeBron, they were all 27 when they won the championship. So Chauncey was too. And he averaged 17 points, 5.7 assists, shot 39% on threes. And so when he was age 22, he only averaged 14 points, 39% from the floor, 36%, and 3.8 assists. So he was he was a slow starter. He was the third player drafted in the draft by the Celtics, but he, he struggled and he bounced around for, to a few teams before he landed with the Pistons and became the hopefully the um, Hall of Fame player he is. Another thing is we don't so we don't have to do this. Uh, Quentin Grimes, who I'm so excited to watch, he is contract he is um, extension eligible, and so you don't have to give him a max extension. But it'll be interesting to see if we extend him. So when Cade, like for example, when you give him that rookie extension next year, he'll still be on his rookie scale contract, and so will Grimes. But so the contract, we can agree to a contract now and extend them for five years after that. So we can have Cade, you know, for six more years, if, you know, if we sign him to that rookie max, the same with Grimes. And so it'd be cool, I think, to get those guys locked up. But it's nothing wrong with watching. Um, we get to watch Grimes the last 28 games. Hopefully he's healthy. And then we could, though, wait until after next year. We could let him play all next year see how he plays, and um, then, because he'll be a restricted free agent. So somebody can offer him, give him an offer sheet. So I, I just as soon sign him before that. I wasn't so sure about Stu when we gave him that. I would have waited until the end of this year before I would have given him the contract. But he could play Thursday against the Pacers because no, um, they're going to wait until, see. I guess, what the courts, the, the NBA is going to wait to see what the court says about that they think that he's just going to likely to get a couple hundred dollar fine and no jail time and he doesn't even have to show up and appear in court so hopefully things work out first do i get I aggravated like big perk you know saying that he shouldn't that he has this um that he's always getting in trouble that he's got this problem and draymond did like 20 things and Nobody said anything about Draymond until the last one where you know he's choked and punched and kicked and all this stuff. And they, everybody's saying, well, yeah, Stu's got this problem. Well, we know that Stu does have a problem with some anger issues. And he was, I think him and um, Eubanks got into it on November 5th. And so that, I think that's why this, all these months later, still spilled over. And, you know, it was funny though, you know, Eubanks said it was a weak punch or, you know, like he didn't even feel it. And so why is it even a big deal then? So why is he, you know, the, the Suns made it a big deal. And he said he was unprovoked, but you can't tell me that he, he wasn't provoked a little bit, that there, it was just one side because they were chest to chest. You know, that's, 
that testosterone that provokes everybody. So anyway, I'm going to talk about this trade, how Kobe almost became a piston. So what made me lead to think about it is Kobe statue just got unveiled recently at, um, in LA. And then also there was talk about LeBron being a warrior, that they're the Warriors owner approached the Lakers to see if LeBron would want to come. But the Lakers, just like with Kobe, they wanted him to be happy. So in 2006, 2007 season, the Lakers finished 42 and 40, and they missed the playoffs two of the last three years. And so in May of 2007, Kobe wanted traded. He demanded a trade. He made it, you know, public. And then later by the fall, Jerry Buss, who was the Lakers owner, he called him into his office and said, we have a trade for you. And the Pistons had won 59 games. And they had that, still those guys, Rip and Tayshawn and Ben Wallace and Rasheed Wallace. And so, you know, he, they had a trade for him. So the trade was Rip Hamilton, Tayshawn Prince, Amir Johnson, who was potentially, he was very young. We drafted him. He was like 19. He was like 6'9". He was a good shooter. He he ended up being an okay player, but not a great player. And a first-round pick. That was the deal. It was a done deal. And I've heard on a podcast like a year ago, Joe Dumars talk about this. So Joe Dumars was our general manager at the time. And he said, it was a done deal. We had it. If Kobe would have said it's a deal, then it would have been done. But Kobe, even though he had demanded to be traded, he backed out at the last second. So... That's just the interesting thing about things. I always, I always say that I, I always wish that I knew what trade offers were made. I wish I would have known, like at the trade deadline last year, what we really got offered for, um, for bogey. So again, we'll never know. But interesting things happen in the league all the time. The Nets just fired Jacques Vaughn, who they had just signed to an extension. So we just signed Monty to a, a big contract. So maybe we'll fire him, but I doubt it. But anyway, ironically. You know, um, Troy Weaver wanted Kevin Alley, and so he didn't get to hire him. I actually personally wanted Jaron Collins, and there was also Charles Lee that I liked, and Kevin Alley was my would have been my third choice of those guys. But still, that's who um, Troy wanted. But Troy um, anyway, so Kevin Alley didn't get the Piston job, so he got hired for the first time. It was his first time as an assistant in the NBA, but now he is going to take over for Jacques Vaughn. So anyway, that just is funny how things go. And um, anyway, I'm excited. So the Pistons play Thursday, you know, against the Pacers. And then Saturday, I'm going to watch the Pistons play. I'll be down there at Little Caesars to watch the Pistons play the Magic, Cade Cunningham bobblehead night. So hopefully I get one. So anyway, I, I think that... Um, I'm, I'm going to miss the season because after this, I have withdrawal symptoms from the Pistons not playing during the All-Star break. So hopefully they come back strong and hopefully they finish the year out good. But most of all, I hope that Monty plays the young core and along with Pontecchio and Grimes and we get to see what we have and we get to make decisions going into next year. But thank you for listening. I'll be on the air after the game Thursday. But be the reason that somebody feels loved and cared for and go Pistons.